Good morning, church. Hey, let's stand together. Put your hands up. Come on, worship with us. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I praise when I'm numbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason to praise. Nice, nice. Wait, what are you doing here? What's up, brothers? 
<laughs> hey, uh, wait. Sunday. Sunday. If you, Sorry. if you're here, there's like a couple of hundred kids over there that don't have anybody watching them. I don't know, man. I just work here. There you go. Hey, this is my good friend, David Tuck. He's our kids pastor. Nice to meet you. So those of you who have heard him talk before knows that anything is about to happen. Anything is about to happen. Hey, if you are here for the very first time with us today, we're so glad that you are here. Right on the seat back in front of you, there is a QR code there. If you'll scan it with the camera app on your phone, it will take you to everything that you need while you're here in service this morning, as well as we would love to pray for you. If so, on that link, if you have something for you or for someone else that we can be praying for, please, please. Let us know, because we love prayer here. Yeah, and there are so many cool stories that happen. Uh, there are too many for us to talk about here on stage. And all of that ministry happens because of the faithful giving of folks just like you. So we want to give you an opportunity to give today. You can do that through the mobile app. You can do it in the kiosks in the lobby. Or if you want to give the way that the founding fathers gave, you write a check. And... <laughs> And you drop that in a basket, I think. Do we still, are we still doing that? And drop it in the basket on the way out. There you go. Hey, where's my ladies at? Look, you ladies have brought the heat for sure. There for are sure. over 330 women already registered for our Flourish Women's Conference this coming week. And it is not too late. You can register all through this week as well. And so ladies, if there's a coworker, a neighbor, a Bring friend, em. a what? I just said bring them. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Sorry. Bring them with you to the Flourish Women's Conference. It is going to be phenomenal. And now speaking of which, 330 women have registered for Flourish. I cannot wait to hear about Dad Tired. The, for the, so for the Dad Tired Conference that's happening at the end of this month, we have 47 people registered <laughs> for Dad Tired. Y'all are killing me. But I get it. Maybe... Maybe you have kids who are birthed through high school and you're just not sure whether or not this conference would be helpful for you. I'm going to help you make that decision by asking you one question. Do you feel confident as the spiritual leader of your home? And if the answer to that is yes, I'm killing it in leading my wife and kids and pointing them to Jesus, then you don't need to come to this conference. If you're doing that, then you're solid. But if the answer is no, if the answer is, I need some help stepping into that role that my children and my spouse desperately need me to be, then this conference is for you. Our speaker, Jared Lopes, wrote a book called Dad Tired and Loving It. And y'all, I am prone to hyperbole. That means, for you, if you're from Draper, that means I exaggerate, <laughs> okay? I am prone to hyperbole. However, I am not being hyperbolic when I say the Dad Tired book is in the top 10 books, best books I've ever read in my whole life. It is the most gospel-centered parenting book directed to dads that I've ever read. And we're going to have that guy here, and you're going to need to hear him. So, guys, I need you to sign up. And, and ladies, since you guys do such a great job Apparently. of signing up, um, we know that you, there are things that you can do or refuse to do in order to get your man to sign up for the conference. Now, I'm just saying, if you were to like reward him for signing up for the conference, that wouldn't be a terrible thing to do. All right. So I have the pleasure of reading our scripture passage for today. It's my bad. You sure you still that's want me to do this? It's my, my bad. Y'all stop acting like that. The man's about to read the Bible. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Well, we are continuing in our sermon series on the book of Mark this morning. And so we're going to be in chapter three, verses one through six. And it says this, Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus's enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. 
Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, come and stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath or is it a day for doing evil? Uh, is this a day to save life or to destroy it? But they would not answer him. Verse five, he looked around at them angrily and with deeply saddened by their hard hearts. Then he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. At once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Let's pray before we continue. Father, we just think we're thankful for this morning that we can gather as a church. We're thankful for your word that still teaches us, that's still living and active. And so God, today as we worship, would you just help us to remember these words that we are declaring as we open up the scriptures this morning, God, would you remind us that it is still alive and active, God. And it has the ability to change us, to mold us more into the image of your son, Jesus, Lord. God, today we give you this time. We give you um, these few moments that we have together as a church body, Lord. We love you and we praise you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, church, let's stand together and sing. Jesus, Jesus, 
So for the better part of 30 years, I've been trying to teach wives not to use marital intimacy (laughs) to manipulate their husbands. David Tuck undid that in 30 seconds, man. (laughs) But if it'll get them here, wives, have at it, man. All All right. (laughs) <laughs> hey, uh, I want to remind you of something coming up on May the 10th, we're having the Hoppers and Jason Crab here. And uh, I- I'm just telling you, man, 
you don't want to miss this. A few years ago, I was going through uh, some really hard things. Man, everybody has valleys in life, right? And uh, Jason Crabb had just released this song called Through the Fire. And it was like a lifeline. I mean, you, has that ever happened to you where you're going through something and there, God just gives you this particular song that just is exactly what you need in that moment? I'm going to tell you, man, it's fantastic. And, and since then, of course, he has many, many, many incredible songs that he has written and performed. And he is one of the best uh, contemporary Christian artists, I think, around. He, He's got an amazing voice. You don't want to miss that. But in addition to him, the Hoppers will be here. Man, and they're a legend in gospel music. And so, uh, man, you don't want to miss this. And, and I know it's easy. Everybody's busy, all that. But, man, this is a Friday night. Go out to eat. Come over here. And I promise you, here's what's going to happen if you'll come. And you're going to worship. You're going to be blessed. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry. And you won't be sorry that you came. Please, please, please. May the 10th, Jason Crabb and the Hoppers. You know, two things people often link together in the Bible is grace and mercy. Those things kind of go together. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is getting from God what we don't deserve. That's why we are saved by grace. We, look, we don't deserve salvation. It, it's an act of grace on God's part. So we're saved by grace through faith. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we do deserve. Hell. I mean, you guys get that, right? Every one of us deserve hell. But because God is merciful, he doesn't give us what we deserve. That's mercy. Mercy is giving someone what they need, not what they deserve. Truth is, we live in a world where people think mercy's for the weak. You know where that comes from? Cobra Kai. You remember Cobra Kai, kind of the nemesis in the Karate Kid movie back in the 80s? Remember the strike hard, strike first, no mercy. Mercy is for the weak. Huh. It's probably true that mercy is for the weak. That really is a true statement. The problem is we just don't understand how weak we are. How desperately we need mercy. It's not something we deserve, it's something we need. So we should really think about mercy in two ways. The first way is God's mercy to us, it's an incredible thing. Uh, I love Psalm 118. Uh, li listen. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Let Israel now say, his mercy endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endures forever. Wow. Wow. You know why God's mercy endures forever? Because we need it forever. God, by his nature, is a merciful God. Everywhere Jesus went, they would remember, you, when you read the gospel, you remember this, right? Everywhere Jesus went, somebody would say, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, a lame beggar. Have mercy on me. Jesus, have mercy on my child who needs healing. Have mercy on me. 
God by his nature is a merciful God. The second way we should see mercy is our mercy to each other. You see, human nature kind of thinks something like this. God, please be merciful to me. But human nature tends to deny other people the mercy that we have received from God. But the Bible teaches us to take what we have received from God and give it away. Matthew 5, 7, in the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus is teaching us how to live under a new covenant, not under the law. He said, God blesses those who are merciful for they shall receive mercy. James 2, 13 says, there will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. Whoo. By the way, this is just another confirmation of the biblical principle. Whatever you need more of, give away. You need some money, give some away. You need love, love somebody a little more. You need mercy, be merciful. Then God will be merciful to you is what James says. What do you need today? Give some away. According to the Bible, this is a big deal. We shouldn't just show mercy. We should love mercy. Micah 6, 8 is one of those real familiar verses in the Bible that tells us exactly what God wants us to do. Micah 6, 8 says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So today in our study of Mark, uh, we've made it to chapter 3, and we're going to see in the first six verses in chapter 3 of Mark that Jesus shows mercy to a man with a lame arm. And we're going to see how the religious leaders respond to that. So in these six verses, uh, I want to share with you six truths about mercy. Here's the first one. Write this down. God's eyes always fall on those who need mercy. Mark chapter 3, verse 1. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Jesus didn't ignore him. He, he didn't uh, blow past him. He noticed this man because God by his nature is merciful. So he notices people who are in need of mercy. I mean, this man didn't walk into the synagogue that day thinking, boy, bam, today's the day I get healed. I doubt getting healed even entered his mind. But it was on God's mind. I mean, he had just learned to live with a deformed arm. But God had a different plan. <laughs> Jesus sees him. And his life's about to change forever. Because Jesus is going to show him mercy. You ever been in need of mercy? Maybe it was like this man because of life circumstances. You didn't ask for it. You didn't want it. It just landed on you. We don't know how this happened. Maybe the man was injured and his arm just couldn't heal back because there wasn't medical technology to do that. Maybe he was just born with a deformed arm. Maybe he got some disease or he got injured and it just withered. We, we don't know. What we know is his arm didn't work. He didn't ask for it. He didn't want it. That's where it was. Maybe it's not that. Maybe you need mercy for another reason. Maybe you need mercy because of circumstances you created yourself. King David in Psalm 51 
wrote his prayer of repentance for committing adultery and really followed that up with murder. And you know how he begins his prayer of repentance? Psalm 51 verse 1, have mercy on me, O God. Because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stains of my sin. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sins. He was asking for mercy for some circumstances that he absolutely created himself. Isn't it an amazing thing, though, about God? God doesn't care why you need mercy. His eyes just see you. He just wants to show you mercy. Second truth about mercy, write this down. Mercy has enemies. I I mean, you know this, right? Some people really don't want other people to receive mercy. I mean, they're just people like that. Strike hard, strike fast. No mercy. Mercy's for the weak. Look what happens next. Mark chapter 3, verse 2. Since it was the Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Now, these religious leaders, the Pharisees, have already made up their mind, Jesus is the enemy. And even if he's going to show mercy, it doesn't matter. We're the enemy of mercy. Jesus is the epitome of mercy. Jesus is mercy incarnate. And we're your enemy. So they parked themselves at the synagogue on the Sabbath and see if Jesus would heal anybody. Now remember, the way God intends us to see the Sabbath is the Sabbath is God's gift to his people. So under the old covenant, you worked six days, then the Sabbath, and you took, took the Sabbath to rest and to worship. Once a week, you get a vacation. I mean, that sounds like a gift from God, right? And that's what he intended. But these religious leaders over the centuries added hundreds of man-made rules to God's instruction about rest, worship on the Sabbath. And eventually, they put them in a book that they still use called the Mishnah, the Jews did. And this became their go-to source about the Sabbath instead of the Scripture. And they're just waiting for Jesus to do something good on the Sabbath so they can accuse him. All right, if you're listening, say amen. Amen. When our own ideas replace God's truth, mercy is the first casualty. So we read this and think, I mean, honestly, why why would anyone care if somebody else was shown mercy? They believe that people like this man with a lame arm, they believe they were lame as a result of their own sin or maybe the sins of their parents. Remember in... uh, In John chapter 9, when Jesus is going to heal this blind man, and his disciples ask him, was he born blind because of his own sin or his parents' sin? Jesus said, neither one. Hmm. Just seems so weird, doesn't it, that somebody would be upset, would want to deny another person God's mercy healing them. Well, 
We have that in us too. And we don't really think of ourselves that way, but the truth is we have that in us too. So before we judge them too harshly, have you ever seen something good happen to somebody you think to yourself, they don't deserve that. They don't deserve that. They don't deserve to get that from the government. They don't deserve to get that free. I got to pay for mine. Ouch. Right? I mean, you see, we, we like to be dispensers of mercy, but we only like to dispense it when we think it's just. But remember what God said. Let, let's look at Micah 6, 8 again. This is, this is important. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. But you know what we do? We get that backwards. We want to love justice and do mercy when we think it fits our idea of justice. Yep, yeah, I'm all about mercy. As long as I think they deserve mercy. But if they somehow get mercy, and I think somehow that's not just, then they, I just don't think they deserve it. See how easy it is for us to, <laughs> we love justice. That's wrong. Okay, they did the right thing, so they deserve some mercy. You know why we love justice and want to do mercy if we think whoever needs some mercy it's just so I'll give you know why we think that way because justice is easier than mercy mercy requires that we love someone we probably don't want to love mercy requires that we do something for somebody that we think may not be right Mercy requires that we leave the justice to God where it belongs and be merciful to people whether we think they deserve it or not. Mercy has enemies. Please make sure you're not one of them. Third truth about mercy. Jesus is mercy on display. Now, I love what happens next. So the, man, those Pharisees, I mean, they really are evil, wicked men. The Pharisees are crawling around like cockroaches in the corner, just hoping Jesus sows mercy on the Sabbath so we can accuse him. And Jesus doesn't disappoint. But I love the way he does it. Mark chapter 3, verse 3. Jesus said to the man, come and stand in front of everyone. I mean, you know, those Pharisees, what's he going to do to me? We have to get him. And Jesus knows. And he just stands up in front of everybody. Hey, now... Now the lame man doesn't even know this is happening. I mean, he, he just at the synagogue to worship. And Jesus says, hey, hey you with the lame arm, come here, come here, come here. Come up here in front of everybody. Me. I mean, <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed about this. And I, the last thing I want to do is just point it out to everybody and put it on display 
and he comes. I love that, man. Jesus puts his mercy on display for everyone to see. He could have just, when he came in, just whispered to the guy, hey, man, meet me out on the seashore here in a couple hours, okay? I want to do something for you. He could have just waited a few hours till the Sabbath was over and done it. But Jesus puts his mercy on full display for all to see and jams it in the face of these godless, self-righteous hypocrites. Hmm. The truth is, every aspect of Jesus' life on earth was God's mercy on display. I mean, Jesus coming to earth, God's mercy. Every time Jesus healed somebody, God's mercy. Every time Jesus forgave, God's mercy. When Jesus was arrested, God's mercy. When Jesus was tried, God's mercy. When Jesus was beaten, God's mercy. When Jesus was crucified, God's mercy. When Jesus rose again, God's mercy. When Jesus went to heaven, God's mercy. When Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, God's mercy. When Jesus comes again, God's mercy. Everything about Jesus' life is God's mercy on display. Question. Does your life reflect the mercy Jesus displayed through his life? Or do you, uh, are you kind of a mercy miser? I give you a little. <clears throat> no, no, not not that much. All right, you can have a little mercy. I guess you deserve it. What's your life look like? Does it reflect God's mercy through Jesus? Fourth truth about mercy. Mercy needs no defense. Look what happens next. The Pharisees, now, they, they think they have him. You know, I mean, he, <laughs> he, he's going to heal on the Sabbath. He's going to do it. He got that guy up there. Look at his arm. He's going to heal him. We got him. Mark 3, 4. Then he turned to his critics and asked. Don't you love that? I mean, they think they're making this about the Sabbath. Jesus is making it about their hypocrisy. Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath? Or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or to destroy it? Bam, there it is. But they wouldn't answer him. I mean, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Everybody sees his arm. The tension in the room is growing. And Jesus, instead of talking to the man, he talks to the Pharisees. Because everybody knew there was this tension. And he says, is it wrong to do good on the Sabbath? I mean, is this a day for good or for evil? And they wouldn't answer him. I guess they wouldn't. You know why? There's no defense for mercy. Mercy needs no defense. When you just show a man with a deformed arm mercy and heal his arm. There's never a bad time to do that, right? There's nothing selfish about that. There's nothing sinful about that. It's just good. It's just merciful. Hmm. Wherever you find a lack of mercy, you will find pride in abundance. You, you see, the longer the Pharisees stiff-armed the mercy of Jesus, 
the harder their pride became and the more they hated Jesus. But Jesus never backed down. One occasion in Matthew 23, man, he just lets them have it. Look at this. What sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you cross land and sea to make one convert, and then you turn that person into twice the child of hell that you yourselves are. Boom. I mean, man, those are powerful words, right? I mean, you, you're putting all these heavy things on people and you go everywhere to make one convert and then you make them twice the son of hell that you are. He just means you think you're pleasing to God because of what you do, but you deny mercy to people who need it. Verse 23, what sorrow awaits you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are careful to tithe even on the tiniest income of your herb garden, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law. Justice, mercy, faith. You should tithe, yes, but do not neglect the more important things. Blind guides, you strain your water so that you won't accidentally swallow a gnat, but you swallow a camel. Jesus never backed down from them. He just kept showing mercy. Why? Because there's no defense for mercy. You want to show people God? Show them mercy. Fifth truth about mercy. When mercy is shown, hatred is near. You know, I, I wish it wasn't true, but it is. Most of the time when somebody, anybody has shown mercy, you can find somebody in the background saying, they don't deserve that. I wouldn't do that. They don't deserve that. Look at verse 5. He looked around at them angrily. These are the Pharisees. But look what it says. And was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. I mean, he was angry because of their attitudes. He was angry because they wouldn't obey the law and love mercy. This is just Jesus. <laughs> he was saddened at their hard heart. Then he said to the man, Hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand and it was restored. What? I mean, what? I mean, that's how Jesus healed, by the way. Hold out your hand. Boom. It's just new. I mean, we don't get a detailed description about what was wrong with the hand, but maybe it was just withered to where you couldn't even tell it used to be a hand. Now it's a fully functioning hand. Maybe it was just broken and deformed and twisted and gnarled. Boom. It's a fully functioning hand. That fast. Mercy. <laughs> I mean, just imagine this is right there in the synagogue. This man's hand is fully restored. And the Pharisees hated Jesus for it. I mean, <laughs> what? Huh. You see, it's so easy for us to condemn that kind of attitude. You know, look at those Pharisees and say, those self-righteous muckety-mucks, who they think they are. The truth is, our hearts are always in danger of becoming hard to the things of God. 
So let's take a minute, examine our own hearts, and see how much mercy we find. So I, I wrote down three questions. Uh, so let's just do a little hard exam and ask ourselves these questions. Here's the first one. Can I still have joy when God shows mercy that I would withhold? Well, that's a, that's a hard question to even ask yourself, isn't it? Here's this situation. I don't think they deserve it. I wouldn't. I, this isn't a circumstance I'd show mercy. This is a time for justice. Can you still have joy when God decides to show mercy anyway? Or do you get hard? They don't deserve it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, know, you know what I mean. Someone shows mercy, you don't think they deserve it. Start getting a little hard, hard. Can you, can you be joyful that they receive mercy instead of being ticked off because you don't think they deserved it? Second question. Does my false sense of justice blind me to God's mercy? Uh, all right, now, look at me. Our sense of justice isn't always false. There's real justice. But that's in accordance to what God says is just. He gets to decide the standard of justice, not us. And when you look at a situation and you say, God clearly says about this, justice is warranted here. But when it's not that, it's not God saying, Here's justice for that. It's you saying, here's what I think is just. Does that blind me to God's mercy? They don't deserve it. By the way, <laughs> you know, we rarely apply that to ourselves. We rarely look in the mirror and go, you don't deserve it. You don't deserve God's mercy. You don't deserve the mercy you receive from someone else. Has God ever shown you mercy that you didn't deserve? If you've lived very long as a Christian, he has. Were you prideful or humble in response? I'm just telling you, man, this happened to me many, many times in my life where God just showed me mercy. I didn't deserve it. In fact, I deserved the opposite. And he showed me mercy. You know when that happens, you don't get all bowed up with pride and say, well, it's about time, God, I deserve that. No. It is incredibly humbling. Right? So why would you then turn and deny somebody else the mercy that you so humbly receive from God. One more question. How aware am I of the mercy God shows me? Did you know God shows you his mercy every day in all kinds of ways? He gives us air, he gives us food, he gives us family, he gives us friends, he gives us church, he gives us houses, he gives us cars. Everywhere we turn, we see God's mercy at work in our lives. 
if we look for it. Look for it. Be thankful for it. All right, last truth about mercy. There is no limit to what a merciless heart will do. Now now look at the response to healing this man's hand. Mercy. At once, the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Now, this is the first time in the gospel that they want to kill him. Now, now, he kept breaking the Sabbath, in their mind, breaking the Sabbath. You're you're breaking our man-made laws about the Sabbath, and that's the thing we love the most. That's when we get highlighted. That's when everybody wants to be us. And you keep breaking it. We know what to do about that. Isn't it interesting that (laughs) Jesus shows mercy but receives judgment? There's no cliche, you know, no good deed goes unpunished. Tell you what, if you're a mercy giver, I'm just telling you, it's not going to take long in your life for somebody to hate you for being merciful. That's just the human heart. A merciless heart is the surest sign of a deceived heart. And a deceived heart always becomes a hard heart. You see, when our heart is hardened by pride, our hand is empty of mercy. A heart hardened by pride believes Satan's lies and does his bidding. Have you ever looked at someone and thought, you know, I I just didn't think they were capable of that. How did they get there? You ever looked at somebody's life that you knew and they just crash and burn and you think, wow, I just didn't think... They would ever do that. I didn't think they were capable of that. How did they get there? There's no limit to what a merciless heart will do. Have you ever looked at yourself and thought, I didn't think I was capable of that. How did I get here? It's a hard place to be. You ever been in desperate need of mercy and thought it was impossible because of what you've done? Have you ever been in need of mercy and just thought it was impossible? It's not because of what you have done. It just life just landed on you, but you've just convinced yourself God is either unaware or doesn't care. Who needs some mercy today? What's the thing that is weighing on you? It won't go away, and you can't get any peace. God wants to give you mercy. What's the thing you've given up on, and you've just decided this is how life is, and it's not going to change? God wants to give you mercy. What's the thing you willingly did and now you think 
I did that on my own. God's not going to help me. God wants to give you mercy. Who needs some mercy today? God's eyes are on you right now. So I want you to do something for me. I want everybody to just stand up. Just stand up. Just stand up. Who needs some mercy today? Come on. Come on. Just come find a place. Who needs some mercy today? Come on. Just come find a place here. Just come kneel right here. Come on. Who needs some mercy? Who thought it's never going to happen? I did this myself. Who, who needs some mercy today? Come on. You know, God loves you. God wants to show you mercy. Come on. Who needs some mercy? Come on. Come right now. Who else? Come on. Who needs some mercy? That's right. Come on. Just come on. Who needs some mercy? Who needs some mercy? Who needs some mercy? His mercy endures forever. You know the greatest thing about God's mercy? He gives it freely and it never runs out. Who needs some mercy? Come on. Come on, there's more people need mercy. Come on, who needs some? That's right, come on, come on. Come on. God's ready to give you some mercy. Who else? Come on, that's right. Come on. Who else? Who needs some mercy? Who needs some mercy? That's right. Come on. Just come on. That's right. Come on. Who else? Just keep coming. God's ready to give out some mercy. God is ready to give out some mercy. Come on. Who needs mercy? God loves you. And he wants to give mercy. You know, God gives us mercy, but God also wants us to be dispensers of mercy. I mean, here's some people right now who are saying, I need some mercy. Who can come get around them and pray for them that God will show them mercy? Just come on. Just come pray for some folks right now. You want, you want to be a mercy dispenser right now? Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God, thank you for your mercy. Thank you, God, that your mercy endures forever. Thank you, God, that you don't care why we need mercy. You just want to help us. Because when we need mercy, nothing else does the job. God, we need mercy. God, I am so grateful for all these folks who can say, I need mercy. God, I pray you pour out your mercy on them right now. Be merciful, oh God. And we pray in your mighty name. Amen. We're, we're going to sing. You guys just stay here. Just stay here at the altar. Take as long as you need. Just let God give you what you need. I've got a friend Closer than a brother There is no judgment Oh, how he loves me I've got a friend he is my strength. He is my portion. With me in the valley, with me in the fire, with me in the storm. Let all my life testify.
forgiveness or healing, His mercies and all. This is our home, the cross it has broken. Death is no more, Christ is the Lord. This is our He's with you. He's for you. He loves you. God bless you. Have a great week.